Young people are dismissed to Children's Church at this time. I'm going to invite the rest of us to turn in our Bibles to the Psalms, and we're going to be looking specifically at Psalm 8. Psalm 8. I'm going to draw your attention to verse 3 of this Psalm. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor, and madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts, of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. Let's read verse 9 as well. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Heavenly Father, we pray that your blessing be upon this preaching of your word today. We pray that you might apply it to hearts through your spirit, and that you might help me to be clear in that which I say about what your word is teaching today. I pray, Lord, that you might bless our time together and the activities of this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. As a young man, I enjoyed reading and seeing films, reading books and seeing films about Sherlock Holmes. Anyone enjoy Sherlock Holmes? I... Uh, just loved that as a kid. And his faithful colleague, Dr. Watson, okay. I was intrigued by Holmes' power of deduction and entertained by the interaction, interaction between Sherlock Holmes and Watson. There is one story you're probably not familiar with in regard to Holmes and Watson. It is when Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson went camping. After a good meal, they lay down, went to sleep. In the middle of the night, Holmes nudges Watson awake and says, Watson, look up at the sky and tell me what you see. Watson said, I see stars, millions of stars, my dear Holmes. And what would you infer from these stars? says Holmes. Well, a number of things. Astronomically, I observe that there are millions of galaxies and billions of stars and planets. Astrologically, I observe that Saturn is in Leo. Horologically, I deduce that the time is approximately a quarter past three. Meteorologically, I expect that the weather will be fine and clear tomorrow. Theologically, I see that God is all-powerful, and man, his creation, small and insignificant. Why, Holmes, what does this mean to you? And Holmes replies, Watson, you fool, someone has stolen our tent. Okay. What do you deduce, my friend, from what you see above you? And around you. Here in this passage, we are considering the art of considering. I, I want us today to reflect upon reflection, to meditate upon a meditation, to think about thinking. This chapter is considered a messianic psalm in that it speaks of the coming Messiah and aspects of his coming into this world. And the New Testament quotes this psalm, I think, three or four times. But our intent today is to look at it in regard to its immediate sentiments that it's trying to get us to consider. Many passages of Scripture have double application, if you will. Pastor Isaac referred to that a, 
a week or two ago in reference to uh, a passage of scripture. That there was a double application. One this psalm does as well. But there is an immediate application that I want us to look at and consider today. Beginning in verse 3 of this psalm, the writer under inspiration of the Holy Spirit says that this is a time to reflect. When I consider, when I reflect, when I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained. This implies a practice of that. It isn't just a one-time event. He thought, thought about it once and never thought about it again. This is, implies a consistent, more than once action. It would be like you would say, well, when I go to the store. You're not just talking about the only time you ever went to a store ever. You're talking about the times when you go to the store. The psalmist is talking about something he does, has done more than once, and thought about consistently. It's pausing to ponder from time to time and deliberate. And especially at night, when he would look up at the heavens, he would pause and ponder. To be someone who pauses and ponders is going to be out of sync with this world, because this world is is shallow. It doesn't pause and ponder. People are preoccupied with trivial things. If, if the depth of your thought life is so shallow as to center on TV shows and athletic events or hobbies, you need to start pausing and discipline yourself to consider bigger things. If your idea of, of pondering is watching TikTok videos, that's sad indeed. The brainless drivel, as I call it, that is typical of the media is insulting. There have been TV programs that I have been ashamed of myself after I've watched, not because the content was, was dirty, but it was because it was stupid. And I thought to myself, I have just wasted two hours of my life just now on this brainless dribble. But most people, I think, don't even, don't even consider how insulting it all is. It's part of sinful humanity's preoccupation with the immediate at the expense of the eternal. You know, if you are a believer especially, you ought to be a deeper person because of it. For many people, if, if they have made their brain sweat to any degree, they throw in the towel. They, they just won't do it. I'm convinced that many people will die and enter a lost eternity because they're too lazy to think. We are not to be that way. The psalmist says, when I consider. Some years ago, there was a young woman whose daughter, who was the daughter of some folks within our church, that the church I was pastoring at the time. And this young woman, and she was, when I say young woman, she was probably mid, late 20s, was having some deep problems, and I was trying to get in contact with her. I kept getting her voicemail, and, and she just wasn't available. And then one day, I saw her at a funeral, and I said to her, I've been trying to get in touch with you. You're a hard person to get in touch with. You must, you're really busy. And she said to me, I try to stay busy all the time. When I'm not busy, then I have to think about my life, and I don't like to think about my life. So apparently some folks refuse to think on purpose. So the psalmist, when he says, when I consider, this was something he did frequently and consistently and on purpose. And it was personal. Notice what he says. He says, when I consider. He's, he's saying that this is something that he individually and personally thought through. It was not something uh, that he thought about at church. Uh, he didn't think about it because others were thinking about it. He considered it himself. You know, I have met people who went forward at an invitation at the end of a service, went forward at an invitation because other people did. Who prayed a prayer because others did. Who were even baptized because others were baptized. We have a baptismal service uh, 
this morning. And I can guarantee you that the individuals following in believer's baptism aren't doing it because of any kind of a herd mentality. I've talked with both of them individually. They're doing it. This is a personal decision. The writer is testifying to a personal individual decision to ponder the eternal. I remember as I was growing up under the influence of a, at the time, a liberal church, and I went through the Sunday school catechism and church membership, but I never knew or understood the gospel until I personally was burdened with sin and realized that Jesus was crucified for me personally, and I received him to my heart and life personally. It's not practical, friend, unless it's personal. There was a preacher of years gone by who tried to explain a personal relationship with Christ to a friend in college, and he said that his friend, his friend had played varsity bap, uh, basketball in, his, uh, in the college they attended, and the college had a seminary associated with it, and so they both went to seminary. And his friend, he said, had a concept of God, but no real personal walk with God. And this preacher, then a student, said, I shared how I had come to Christ and the difference he had made in my life. And as we talked, my friend began to get the picture. And then suddenly his eyes lit up. He said, you mean I can play one-on-one -on -one with him? And he said, yes, it's one-on-one. -on -one. So this was a time to reflect that was very personal for the psalmist. And it was a time to reflect upon a person. It was a person to consider. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained. Who is he talking about there? He's talking about God. So he's saying, when I consider what you have done, the creation, my friend, points to a creator. The creation is testimony to a creator. Someone observed this. He said, today we can marvel at the heavens with more data that was, than was available to David's unaided eye. For example, we, can, we know that in one second, a beam of light travels 186,000 miles, which is about seven times around the earth. It takes eight minutes for that beam to go from the sun to the earth. In a year, that same beam travels almost six trillion miles. Scientists call this a light year. Eight billion light years from Earth is halfway to the edge of the known universe. Within the universe, there's a hundred billion galaxies, each with a hundred billion stars on the average. In all the galaxies, there are perhaps as many planets as stars, 10 billion trillion. These statistics make us, take us beyond human comprehension. David didn't know all of that. He looked up and he see, sees the heavens before him. And he considers the fact that God created all of that. Certainly it's the Bible's consistent testimony. The heavens declare the glory of God. Psalm 19, 1 says, the firmament showeth his handiwork. Psalm 33, 6 by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Verse 9 continues, for he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Jeremiah thirty-two seventeen. Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power, and stretched out arm, and there's nothing too hard for thee. There is no debate in Scripture about whether God did that. The creation didn't get here by itself. It has a cause, and it wasn't some random explosion called the Big Bang that took place a billion, billion years ago, or however many years they want to attach to that. Theologian John Gerstner was once asked the question, why, why matter couldn't be its own cause? And Gerstner replied, he said, what's the matter with matter? The matter with matter is that matter has a matter. Or if you want, matter has a mutter. It has a cause. Everything does. And the Bible tells us in no uncertain terms that God is that cause. So he says, consider what God has done and consider the power that it took, the work of thy fingers. Now, the Bible talks about his fingers. 
talks about the, the right arm of God. It talks about God coming and going. Those are what we call anthropomorphisms. That was, that's your word of the day. But it, what it is, it's speaking of God in human terms. God is a spirit. The Bible talks about his right arm or his ears, his coming, his eyes. We're speaking of God in human terms with the understanding that he is not in his essence human. The point, the writer of the psalm is that God created. And Genesis tells us God spoke and the universe was created from nothing, out of nothing. Ek nihilo is the Latin expression. By his power, he, and, and God wasn't, when it says he rested on the seventh day, it wasn't because he was all tuckered out. You know, he felt, you know, he, he collapsed in whatever the equivalent of, of a heavenly lazy boy would be and said, whew, am I out of gas? No, God, God wasn't winded by this. Genesis 18, 14 says, is there anything too hard for the Lord? The Bible is clear that he created it. And David looks up in the heavens and he says, when I consider all of this and the power that it took, but not only the power, but his sovereignty. Notice in verse 3, the moon and the stars which thou hast, what's the word? Ordained. He, he chose to have it so. It's the idea of a purposeful decisive act. He put the stars where they are because that is where he wanted them. He put the moon where it is because that is where it needs to be. And we could probably talk a while about the moon's precise proximity to the earth and the tides that function because of the moon and all the beneficial things that happen because of that. But all of that aside, the psalmist is saying that it is there because that is where God decided it would be. He ordained. And what the psalmist is observing is that all of the astral bodies, all of the creation in the universe are the result of a purposeful and powerful God. Seculars like to say that all that we see in the heavens above us and the earth below is all the result of random chance. It was just kind of a, a cosmic accident that took place finally because of out of, out of the infinite realm of possibilities. It just happened to happen the right way here. Giant explosion that resulted in all in the earth with all of its intricate complexities and ecosystems as, as a result of that and other chance happenings. But when has an explosion ever resulted in order? On May 18, 1980, Mount St. Helens in Washington exploded. 1,300 feet of mountain blew into the air, a force 10 million tons of TNT and 500 atomic bombs. 150 foot tall Douglas firs were knocked down as far as 17 miles away. Incredible power, but not even a cap and a cap gun compared to the power of creation. And that explosion didn't result in anything complex, but only utter chaos in its wake. Explosions do not result in order. Neither does life and all of its complexity result from chance. Scientists used to say that simple cells were simple, but the, with the advent of more sophisticated technologies, they now tell us that even single simple cells are complex. Yet these same scientists will also say that even that complexity is the result of random chance evolution. They say that given the infinite number of universes and given infinite time, everything could, could and has come together as we see it today. Some, some have referred to this as the infinite monkey theorem. Did you ever hear of that? The infinite monkey theorem? There's a couple versions of it. States that a monkey hitting keys at random on a typewriter keyboard for an infinite amount of time will almost surely type any given text, including the complete works of William Shakespeare. So you, you get the picture. Given an infinite amount of time and an infinite, you know, 
infinite efforts that it's going to result in something cohesive. Some researchers over in the UK actually tested to see if monkeys on typewriters could make anything happen that was legible. And according to the article I read, they couldn't produce a single word by chance and mostly just destroyed the typewriters. The infinite monkey theorem is a lot like uh, monkeys and the clock parts theory. Have you heard that one? You take a clock apart, not a digital one, obviously. Young people, there was a time when clocks had moving parts, and you could take them all apart, and they had to be put together, you know, when they were constructed. But the infinite clock, or the infinite monkey theorem says that you could take a clock completely apart and put, it, put the parts in a, in a paper bag, and, and if you took an infinite number of monkeys and an infinite number of bags, an infinite number of clock parts, and, and had each individual shake all of these, that eventually, over an infinite amount of time, that, that the, all the clock, clock parts being shaken up would come together to be one working clock on their own. What do you think? No. It, that, that is... That is absolute craziness. And yet that is what is being argued, that this world is the result of chance. It takes more faith to believe in, in that than to believe in God. That, that's what the psalmist is stating here. When I think of what I behold in the creation, when I consider this, the moon, the stars... and I consider the person, it makes me wonder. And that's, that's the next part of this. It's a cause of wonder. When I think about this, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him. When I think about this, I think of our comparative insignificance. Why do you even pay attention to us? Psalm 114, verse 3 says, Lord, what is man that thou takest knowledge of him? Job wrote in chapter 7, verse 17, What is man that thou shouldest magnify him, and that thou shouldest set thine, hand, thine heart upon him? He's talking about our, our comparative insignificance. Now, in, here, here's, consider this, if you will. Imagine yourself in a stadium, and it's a large stadium, and there's 50,000 other people in that stadium. But the stadium itself is within a city of 4 million people. And that city is in a nation of 326 million and a world population of 8 billion. We live on a round piece of rock, dirt, and water about 25,000 miles around in a solar system with other planets that make us look puny by comparison. And these planets revolve along a little puny star in a galaxy that's traveling at the speed of light would take thousands of years to get from one end to the other. And this galaxy is in a universe that contains a multitude of galaxies that are bigger than the one we live. In all of that, we are just a speck on a speck on a speck. Do you feel small yet? In comparison to all of that, how significant are you? The humanist atheist would have to respond, not very. H.G. Wells said this, Man is an inhabitant on a thin rind, on a negligible detached blob of matter belonging to one of the millions of stars, one among millions of island universes. The psalmist didn't know what we know about the heavens today, but he could still see with his eyes, without the aid of telescopes, the vastness of the heavens and think to himself how comparatively insignificant we are. But not simply our comparative insignificance, our amazing significance. What is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him? The astonishing preoccupation that God would know to you and I that God would even know who we are, that we exist. That God would be concerned about you and I. That's what that last part of verse 4 says, and the Son of Man that thou visitest him. The word visitest is not talking about dropping by for a coffee 
you know, kind of visit. It's the idea of interacting with the point the psalmist is making. That why would God, who made the heavens and the stars and the moon, want to have anything to do with you and me? Why would someone who created the universe be concerned with us at all? Why would he even mess with us? Why bother? That's the point the psalmist is making. The New Testament writer, the Apostle Paul in Romans, takes it even further. He asks the question, why would a holy, sinless God send his only son, Jesus, to die for people who were sinners and who were his enemies? It says that in the book of Romans. It says there in verse 6, for when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Paul is saying some people might give their lives for another person because they're deemed worth it. They are worth dying for. But God sent the Lord Jesus into this world to give his life for sinners who in their heart were rebels and enemies against God. That is astonishing. It is bewildering, surprising, astounding. It is amazing grace. It's amazing. The astonishing preoccupation that God would have concerns for us of all, let alone love to give his son Jesus to die in our place. Then he refers to the invested worth that God has made us. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and has crowned him with glory and honor. The invested worth, when he says lower than angels, but higher than honor, in honor than angels. Angelic... Uh, beings are powerful beings. They have more ability and power, but we are of higher rank and worth. We are crowned with glory and honor. They are not. We are. That expression, we're crowned with glory and honor. The idea is as a soldier who has a medal pinned on his chest or he's increased in rank and maybe given a public, public acclaim, honored, uh, that is the idea that mankind is is put in a position of elevation that God has invested worth. And not only that, but very quickly, endowed with authority over all creation. Verse 6 through 9, you've made him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. You've put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, beasts of the field, fowl of the air, fish of the sea, whatsoever passes through the paths of the sea. Oh, Lord, how excellent is your name throughout all the earth. God considers it an honor for man to be given authority over creation. To be put in a position of trust, he put man in charge of creation. Now, this is a stark dichotomy with the world's viewpoint. The tree hugger says that mankind is just part of this world and not a very important part. In fact, sometimes they refer to people, to humanity, as parasites in this world. That we're destroying the planet and they actually, I think personally, they worship the planet. But God is saying here that humanity is over the world. We are to be good stewards of this world, but we are stewards nonetheless. And we're special because God has made mankind special. He has made us of worth. It is because of that, you know, we believe that life is, life, innocent life especially, is precious because it's made in God's image. Unbelievers will often cite religion as a source of violence and death, but all that any murderous religious fanatics have done pales in comparison to the tens of millions, perhaps hundreds of millions, who perished under the atheistic hands of Joe Stalin, Mao Zedong, or Pol Pot. Hitler's death machine, fueled by the evolutionary dogma of the survival of the fittest, determined that the Germanic races were superior and other races fit only to be subjugated or murdered by the millions, they were not, in his perverted and evolutionary scheme, worth anything. They were unfit. What the Bible is telling us here is that God places value upon you and I. And, and you know, David is looking up, and he, he 
thinks about the entire creation and it's like, Poof! you know, the, the world refers to it as your, your mind blowing. This is mind blowing. That God created all of this. And yet, he thinks about you and I, not only just thinks about, but so loved the world, the Bible says, that he gave his only begotten son. Wow. The psalmist exclaims in wonder after looking at the heavens, what is man? Why should someone who has done such marvelous things, marvelous things think of me? You know, you cannot appreciate the wonder of salvation without an understanding of God and all his might, his holiness and his love and the vastness of, and the wonder that all of, of which he's created, he thinks of you incredible as it may seem. And when you understand this about him, familiar verses regain their mystique. Verses that maybe you've heard since you were a kid that you may even be able to quote, but they don't have much impact upon you. But when you think of it in light of this, when, it, when John 3, 16, a case in point, when we think of that, for God so loved the world, filled with nasty, selfish little sinners. This God who created the millions of the stars, the vast galaxies, the limit, the universe, so loved the world, Little sinners who live on this bluish green speck of dust compared to the vastness of the universe that he sent his only begotten son, Jesus, who visited us. He was God with, he was God with skin on dying in your place that whosoever you and me insignificant, but significant sinners believes, realizes their sinful condition and bow before the creator who gave his son on the cross that these people should not perish. They would not experience eternal death, separation from God in hell forever, but on the contrary, have everlasting life, the very life of the eternal God dwelling within them in the person of the Holy Spirit, and that they would be forgiven and, and, and regenerated and born again by his spirit. When you believe, have you believed on this, on this God? that gave his son Jesus to die in your place. This God who, you know, reasonably could have said, not worth it. This God who created everything, all these, this, this, the vastness of creation is concerned about you and loves you personally. So the question is, have you trusted him personally? Have you come to faith in that person and work of Jesus for you? So the next time, friend, as we sang a bit ago, that you walk at night beneath majestic skies. Know behind them is a God, all wise, who fixed the stars, each in its lonely place, and wrapped them in a darkened robe of space. O oh, mighty God, how wonderful art thou to love the world while heavens before thee bow. I fail to comprehend it all somehow. Almighty God, how wonderful art thou. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Young men who are going to be baptized can go prepare yourself at this time. The rest of us, I wonder, can we pause and consider for a few moments? The psalmist says, consider. Will you? Right now, do you, do you have the depth to do that? I hope you do. I think God has endowed you with the potential, the, the ability. Would you consider what he says here and appreciate the God who loved you so much, the God who created everything in this world, has his thoughts upon you and loved you so much that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for you to take all of your sin and your punishment upon himself and that you might have his righteousness 
and have eternal life. What a wonderful thing. What, what an astounding thing. But there may be someone here that that hardly phases you. It hardly impacts your thinking at all. And let me, out of concern and love for you, say this. If it doesn't impact you, then maybe you've never made it personal. Maybe that has never become reality for you. Maybe you have never paused to consider this. And I would invite you, even in this moment, to pause and consider that Jesus died for you. He died for you. And he took your place of punishment, took your guilt, your condemnation upon himself, that you might know forgiveness and eternal life. Will you trust him even now? And to prove the reality of it all, he arose from the dead. In your heart of hearts, if you have never trusted Christ, I, I would ask you in this moment of quietness between you and God, no one else, as far as this decision is concerned, no one else matters in this room. You and God right now, dear God, thank you for, thank you for loving me. Pray this. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for noticing me. Thank you for value, valuing me. And I ask you right now to forgive me and come into my heart and life. I trust Jesus personally now. And I thank you for loving me that much to give the Savior to die for me. Our Heavenly Father, we ask God that you might work in lives, work in hearts. And I pray that during this time that we call the invitation. May this be a time of pondering. May it time uh, be a time of pausing, be a time of meditation upon your vastness and your wonder and your maj majesty and the wonder that you have sought us out and singled us out for your affection and your love. We do great. Thank you for that. The pianist play an hymn of invitation as God deals with you, would you deal with him? Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time together, and we pray that in these next few moments, as we, we see two uh, follow you in believer's baptism, I pray, Lord, you might make this a precious time for them especially. We thank you for their willingness to obey you in this matter, and we pray, Lord, that you might make this time a blessing not only to them, but to, uh, to those gathered here to witness this. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.